On today's episode of Locked On Fantasy Basketball, I'm going to be taking a look at the 22 teams set to resume action in the Orlando bubble, starting with the Washington Wizards and the Brooklyn Nets, Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it, indeed. Our Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. With the NBA's resumption of play a couple of weeks away, I thought it would be a good idea to just give a bit of a refresher, talk a little bit about the 22 teams heading down to Orlando. For those of you who are playing resumption fantasy leagues, for those of you looking to get an edge in DFS, in uh, in betting, we're just going to talk about what's actually happening with these teams, and we're going to talk to hosts across the Locked On Podcast Network about their teams and what we can expect down in Orlando. To talk about the Washington Wizards, I'm joined by the new host of the Locked On Wizards podcast, Renee Washington is here with me. Renee, welcome to the show and welcome to the network. Thank you, Josh. I'm so happy to be here and I'm, I'm excited. Everyone's been so welcoming so far. So I'm looking forward to talking Wizards and with you talking all things NBA. Thank you. So the, the Wizards are in an interesting spot here, of course. They come in with a pretty sizable margin between themselves and the, the playoffs, five and a half games at the moment, which they, they need to get to within four to force a play, play in game. But that task has been made you know, significantly harder by the absence of their two best players. We know John Wall's not there, but their two best players from during this season, Bradley Beal, who has a mysterious shoulder injury, and Davis Bertans, who is preserving his knee health for upcoming free agency. So that is the three best players on this team, the two best players from this season not there. So let's, uh, let's cut straight to it, Renee. Look, do they have any chance of even forcing this play-in game? You know, it... As you mentioned, the task was already tall and it just got taller this past week as we saw that, you know, Bradley Beal and Davis Bertans are not going to be playing. I mean, it's just incredibly a difficult, an incredibly difficult task for them coming into this res- resumption of the league because the Wizards, as you mentioned, are already on the outside looking in, already trying to figure out a way to get into the playoffs. Bradley Beal was doing a lot offensively for the team and now he's not going to be there so it just leaves you wondering I know some have even said what is the point of the Wizards even going down to Orlando so I think for this specific instance in terms of getting into the playoffs a small goal that the Wizards have had is to get into the playoffs just to be able to make it even if it's that number eight seed just to be able to make it it's a small milestone to hopefully get them working in the right direction to be a team that is competitive in the east and and looking to potentially be a top team in the east in the future but now there's so much unknown we have no idea what to expect from this team. The only thing that is a benefit is the fact that they are counted out. Nobody is expecting them to do anything. So one of the best things that an, an athlete or a team can have is no expectations whatsoever to allow you to come in. They come in, they do bad, everyone expects that. They come in and do well, you're catching everyone by surprise. So honestly, in this situation, it's it's more an opportunity to build for the future more than anything. But the the ability to even get into the playoffs is going to be – very difficult. I won't say impossible. Nothing's impossible. But we'll see what happens. I mean, they, they have no pressure on them at this point, essentially. They lose their two highest scorers, and they don't have anyone on this team who scored over 15 points per game. Bertans and Beal combined for 46 points per game this season. That's going to be tough to replace, but let's try and work out how they will replace it. Of course, their starting center, Thomas Bryant, missed a bunch of time this year, but he looks to be fully healthy. I imagine... This is how I imagine the starting lineup, Renee, is going to look for this team down there. I think we're going to have Shabazz Napier uh, starting at the one. I think we're probably going to have uh, Rui Hachimura and Thomas Bryant at the four and the five. Now, the two and the three are a big question. Before the uh, break in play, Jerome Robertson started some games. Isaac Bonga was starting. Troy Brown had seemingly fallen out of favor with Scott Brooks. So how do you see... They're probably the three major candidates to start at those two positions. How do you think that will break down in terms of who starts and who gets the bulk of the minutes at those other two positions? Well, I do think... I mean, I saw Thomas Bryant talking heavily about just the work ethic he's been... the work he's been doing right now in this time to get back. His mindset, he was saying in an interview, has been total tunnel vision, just getting his body right 
and getting back into the swing of things, um, his upper body, his lower body, you know, just being as, as much in shape and ready to go as possible. I think even as we're discussing a possible starting five, we have to take a step back and remember this is a chance for players to really prove themselves. You know, you have you have Thomas Bryant, you have Rui Hachimura, but we don't really know who else is. A lot of these pieces are question marks right now. So for the future of this team, and if, if I'm coming into this, I'm looking at it as an opportunity to really show your worth, to really show that you should be a starting player in this in this team right now. And then now as you have players, we don't know what's going to happen in the future with Bradley Beal, John Wall, and their future with the Wizards. But regardless who is leading this team, that you can be right there as the number two or number three guy. So I think that the starting lineup really is going to come down to a lot as we see for consistency, for who's going to be able to step in and, and find a way to impact the game. But I don't know who that's going to be right now because we just haven't seen enough from these guys because they have been more of role players. They have been able to take the back seat in a sense and they're let it and, and having players like Bertans and Bradley Beal, those two guys leading the way. So it's going to be difficult to see. And I honestly, unfortunately, they don't have time to really figure it out. There's not a lot of time to, to play around with who's going to be the starting five. But as they're working out and, and leading up to the first game, it is going to be very important that they use as much of this time to not only get back into playing, but also to figure out who's going to lead this team, who's going to be the number one and two guy as they try to make a push for the playoffs. Yeah, I think that's almost going to have to be a combination of Shabazz Napier and Ish Smith because they're probably the two most experienced guys uh, who are going to be playing rotation roles. Everyone else is pretty young. And I think that's, yeah, you talk about a goal of them making the playoffs. It's probably unlikely, but getting minutes and you know, minutes of large roles into players like Hachimura, like Bryant, like Brown, uh, like any of these other guys that they're trying to find out what they're going to do. You know, Isaac Bonga's not even 20 yet. Yeah, Jerome Robinson's his second season in the league. Guys like Garrison Matthews, who showed a little bit mm -hmm. before he yeah, got that's injured. Huge. So getting this opportunity is, is massive. Now, Robinson's an interesting one to me here because it came across at the trade deadline, started the last three games that he played, and the role was all over the place. 26 minutes, 36 minutes, 14 minutes. So it's hard to sort of judge, but he's not that interesting to me in terms of the future of this team. Troy Brown is. Why has Scott Brooks been so anti putting Brown into a larger role? Even when opportunities have arisen, his minutes have fluctuated. He hasn't started a game since the 3rd of January continually coming off the bench. And in some of those games, he did play decent minutes, but his last nine games, he played only one of those over, over 30 minutes and only two of those over 25 minutes and was routinely getting 15, 16 minute a night opportunities for a guy that they picked in the first round just a couple of years ago. So what has been the issue with Brown? Is this? Do you think there is a chance for him to really push forward here or is he going to be subject to the whims of Brooks's rotations? You know, it, it is very odd to see the inconsistency in terms of what we're seeing from Troy Brown's role with the Wizards. And I think that the hard part is he's still so young, so you can't fully write him off yet. So it has to be a decision of, okay, are we going to, as, as the Wizards, are you going to take do what you can to make the most and use Troy Brown before it becomes a point that you're just going to have to maybe move him and um, try to bring someone else in. I mean, you, you look at his skill set, you look at his ball handling ability, His he's a decent playmaker, he does well on the boards. He brings a lot or can bring a lot to the team, I should say. So I'm not sure where the, where the, the gap is. You know, I don't, I don't know if it's his, his shooting is pretty average. I think he's very average. It's just trying to figure out, can he consistently bring some sort of a, something to the court? And I think that, you know, for Scott Brooks, looking at what Troy Brown does from, you know, the beginning of his career to now, I feel like he thinks, in, in my mind, he looks at Troy Brown as not being a great fit alongside with Ish Smith. You know, and when you look at what how they work together, it just hasn't been able to show Brown's strength. So it's just trying to figure out who does he play best with? What rotation is he in? What role is he in so that we can maximize his time on the court? And now, what better time than now when you don't have Bradley Beal and, you ha you know, the ball can be in his hands a little bit more um, without Beal on the floor. How is he going to step up in that role? So a player like him, I mean, we talk about Ish Smith, we talk about Napier, a player like him is going to have this opportunity to really show their worth and that they belong because I honestly feel like as the Wizards are looking to turn a corner and looking to be more competitive in the East, he's someone that could be on the chopping block moving forward. So, you know, there, this, this is an opportunity for, for Brown to really step up and find a way to make an impact with, with a team that has no expectations right now. He's a, he's a pretty low usage player, uh, under 18% usage this season. 
Um, and you did talk about yeah his impact and his advanced metrics are pretty poor. He's a negative one point six in PIPM, which which is quite low. And you compare it to the guy who was starting over him, Isaac Bonga, who was you know, significantly positive in most of those advanced numbers. Uh, low tr- true shooting as well for Brown. And that combination with Smith is an interesting one because both those guys do need the ball in their hand and they both can't shoot very well. So that is not a great combination. But let's let's look a little bit. I was gonna say more positively, but. I was a little bit disappointed with how Thomas Bryant um, was used also this season. There is multiple centers, Mo Wagner, uh, Anzes Pesesniks, Jan Mihinmi there. And it it felt like Brooks was never really comfortable in giving Bryant just, hey, you are our starting center, go and play 30 minutes. He only averaged 24 minutes a game. Some of that was due to his return from those multiple foot problems. But also before that, he wasn't going out there and playing the role of a starting center. That's because his defense is absolutely horrible. But do you think, again, we're looking at a guy who's 23 versus a low upside player like Possessionix, a old free agent, 34-year-old Mihinmi, do you think that Brooks will finally go, all right, show me what you can do. You've got eight games. Here's some minutes. Yeah, I think the hard part... Go ahead, Renee. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the hard part is that you look at someone like Thomas Bryant and the way he finished last season. You know, he was he was getting he was averaging about 10.6 rebounds at the end of last season. So coming into this season, it was, you know, kind of a... a reassuring thing or something to look forward to to see how he would step into the role coming into this year and unfortunately although a lot of people expected him to come back stronger as you mentioned there it wasn't really there he was he you know of course injuries are a big part of it as well but just going into the season he didn't really step up to to the plate he didn't really step up and bring the numbers that was expected so you know I think for Thomas Bryant that's why this time period him and there have been a lot of players in my opinion around the the league that during this time have to make sure that you're not slacking this is a chance to play catch up in a sense you know while there are no games going on while players are training on their own if if i'm thomas bryant you have to make sure that you're getting yourself in top shape getting yourself healthy getting yourself able to be a player that especially now that we've seen bradley beal and bertans not are are not going to be in orlando being able to be someone that the wizards can build around and I think that for Scott Brooks and, and even looking at what Thomas Bryant has done from last year, this year, you know, it just is a matter of will we be able to get him to turn that corner, be more consistent, provide rebounds, points, get stats, be better from his in, in terms of his shooting percentage from the field in general, um, just be able to provide more. And so I think right now for the Wizards as a whole, this is a common theme as we're talking through all these different players. We don't really know what to expect from one game to the next, let alone from the start of the season to the end of the season. So in this time where they have, this is it. You don't have a whole season. This is it. What are you going to do? How are you going to step up to this opportunity where you have a chance to hope to try to close that gap and get into the Eastern Conference playoffs versus being what everyone right now is, is expecting, which a lot of people are, have written them off, going in and underperforming and just getting sent back home right away not even making it to playoffs so I think for a player like Thomas Bryant as we're talking through Brown and you know the different players that we're talking through it's a really tough time for them because this is a defining moment for you there's no Bradley Beal there's no John Wall there's no Davis Burton this is all on you this is the chance to either step up it's a sink or swim or sink or sink or drown excuse me sink or swim moment you either step up you swim you have your overperform or you unfortunately sink in a sense where you come in you do exactly what a lot of people are expecting which is not much and then now the Wizards are back to the drawing board and Scott Brooks honestly has to be looking to make moves moving forward to make this team more competitive in the east um Bryant interestingly over his last 18 games was 11 of 18 from three which is 61 percent so I don't expect that number to continue but shooting over 40 40 percent from three over the course of the season the last player we'll talk about here is Rui Hachimura who you know, played a lot of minutes as a rookie 30 minutes a game uh pretty negative in most of his impact metrics he's like a minus 2.3 in PIPM his true shooting was below average he actually had a low usage but he is the guy that has uh or that Brooks has shown the faith in to take on a larger usage role and I I expect his usage to really, really jump up in this bubble as someone who is just because you know, defensively he has significant struggles, but I think they're going to feed him the ball a lot offensively. Um, it may not go well in other areas of the game, but I think he's in line to put up, you talk about sink or swim moments, I think Rui Hachimura is in line to put up a pretty significant chunk of points down here in Orlando. Yeah, I think the big thing that he brings is some somewhat consistency. You know, we, we do know more than other players. Of course, it could be better, but we do know more than other players on this Wizards roster right now what we can expect from Marie Hachimura when he steps on the floor. You know, I think he's someone that 
um, has the ability in this moment because he doesn't have a defined position because he's kind of is more versatile, can play the small forward, can play the power forward um, because he is someone that, you know, his, his perimeter game is developing. He's, we see him slowly getting better. His defense, as mentioned, definitely needs work. But I think for Rui Hachimura in this, in this group, he's someone that can kind of be a pivotal role as a, as a role player in a sense as they're looking to just be competitive. So he's someone that if, if I'm looking at the Wizards roster, he's got to be that secret um, weapon in a sense, if, if that's possible, for someone that's going to really surprise people and have a breakout, breakout run here in Orlando. You know, I look at someone like Pascal Siakam with the Raptors and what he was able to do last year and transition into this year. If I'm Marie Hachimura, I'm not saying he's pa- Pascal Siakam by any stretch of the imagination, but you want to use this opportunity, make a run, make a name for yourself, be continue to be consistent, developing those areas of your that are weak, like your perimeter game and your defense, so that hopefully next year we can continue to see you grow in that role with the Wizards to be someone that is hopefully more of an impact player. But, you know, I think as we're talking about, you know, it's just, it's very difficult to even figure out who's going to be able to step up when we look across the Wizards roster because between injuries, between inconsistency, between just a lot of players that don't know their role or haven't really figured themselves out to be able to be an impact player on for the Wizards, we don't know what to expect. And so going into Orlando, it is um, in a sense something that could be a positive, as mentioned, is there's literally no expectations. But for these players, this is their career on the line. If, and in my opinion, this is – this is a test. You know, if Rui Hachimura, Bryant, Thomas, what are you going to do when all eyes are on you, when you have the balls in your hand, more possessions, defense is more reliant on you. Well, how are you going to step up to this opportunity? So for the Wizards as a whole, as we're, prog- as we're preparing for Orlando, that's something that I'm looking forward to seeing is what is this team going to do that everyone's counted out with all, a lot of players that are fi- trying to figure themselves out, find their identity, to really step up and be more competitive so that as we prepare for next year or the year after, the Wizards are a team that's going to be in the conversation instead of a team that is on the outside looking in. So I look at this opportunity for all these players as we're talking through to really show their worth, to really show that they belong here. Because as I keep saying, I think for Scott Brooks, for the, for the entire Wizards organization, changes are going to need to be made. If, if something better does not come out of this next eight games to even get them into the playoffs. Changes are without a doubt going to need to be made. So Hachimura, I think, is one that has a better opportunity to be able to step up in Orlando, but we also have no idea how these players are going to return coming off of the pandemic and after sitting and not having games for the last few months. So a lot of unknown, but hey, some of the best moments in, in players' careers have come from when we either counted them out or didn't count them at all. So we'll see what happens. If you are playing fantasy at this point, you guys like Hachimura, Bryant, Napier, um, Brown, even Wagner, perhaps, and Smith are probably going to be your better options uh, on this squad. But Renee, thank you for for coming on and talking about this Washington Wizards team and their resumption of play in Orlando. And make sure, guys, you are checking out Renee over on Locked On Wizards as she starts uh, hosting the show at the moment, taking over, and uh, wish you all the luck, Renee, and thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for the game to get back games to get back going so we can see how all this plays out. But I appreciate you, Josh, and I'm looking forward to getting locked on Wizards going. So thank you. Now we're going to talk about a team that the Wizards were uh, or are potentially looking to catch in this playoff race or at least force a play in with, and that is the Brooklyn Nets. And I'm joined by the host of the Locked On Nets podcast, Josh Bass, is here with me. Josh. The Nets um, are a shell of the team that we expected at the start of the season. They're a shell of the team that we left when the season uh, stopped. Um, let's just talk about who's not going to be there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know how much time you have to run <laughs> through this this laundry list of players, but uh, obviously, you know, we have the we have the two big guys in KD and Kyrie that aren't there, uh, and you know, this kind of has uh, spiraled out of control. First, Wilson Chandler you know, uh, says he, he's not going to go because he wants to spend, you know, time with his family, doesn't want to go into the bub- bubble. And all these all these reasons are perfectly understandable. Uh, but when it rains, it pours. So Wilson, no Wilson Chandler, uh, no DeAndre Jordan or Spencer Dinwiddie, as they both tested positive for COVID. You know, Dinwiddie was a bit up in the air on if he was going to be able to make it back, but he had another positive COVID test a couple days ago. So he uh, will for sure not, not be there. And it was kind of the Nets' most consistent guy this year. And then uh, Torian Prince will also not be there because he uh, too tested positive with COVID. So the Nets basically have uh, a brand new roster with signings of Tyler Johnson, 
Justin Anderson, uh, and then, you know, yesterday and today, Jamal Crawford, Michael Beasley, Dante Hall. Uh, this is a pretty unrecognizable team, Josh. Yeah, exactly. It is a weird, weird-looking team. They only have one center on the roster, which is going to be really interesting to see how they run that, because Nick Claxton also not going to Orlando yeah, with, a, yeah. with a shoulder issue. Now, let's get the news out of the way now, Josh, because I want to talk about this. Jamal Crawford, 40-year-old Jamal Crawford, and Michael Beasley signed yesterday. Beasley, of course, won't even be able to play the first five games at Orlando at this point, unless they've done something while I've been sleeping to renounce his uh, suspension that he uh, had at the start of the season before he was waived by the Lakers. Um, then the quotes coming out from Jacques Vaughn, who, we, hey, let's let's not forget that Jacques Vaughn's actually an NBA uh, head coach again at this point, saying, we made these signings because we want to show that we're there to win. Now, I would argue that having Jamal Crawford and Michael Beasley on your team probably leads to less wins than having other players on there. Um, Jamal Crawford, great guy, legendary player, unbelievable six man, has been a negative NBA player for the last three or four seasons, though. How do you see this signing? What the hell is the point of it? They say, oh, he's going to go out there and get buckets, or he's going to go out there and make shots. I agree that he'll go out there and take shots. I'm not particularly sure that he'll make them. And you know, then we give up tons on the other end. I, I see absolutely no benefit outside of Kyrie and KD going, can you sign our mates? Yeah, it's really weird because there is absolutely no tangible benefit with these signings now for the bubble period and also moving into next season when the Nets hope to be a championship contender. Neither of these players will, will help at all. You know, Jamal Crawford, as you mentioned, is washed. And he's a great guy. But, you know, it's fine that at his age, at 40 years old, he's not going to be able to contribute on an NBA basketball court in any sense. And if you look at his kind of year-over-year uh, -year production, one, he hasn't played the season at all. But even going backwards, you know, he hasn't had even close to an average true shooting percentage from 2014-15 onwards. And this is a guy who's really only discernible NBA skill was always scoring. So at 40, I mean, what, what's the point of having him there and giving him minutes and shots as opposed to seeing, you know, if a guy like Chris Chioza might stick or if Tyler Johnson can be a reclamation project. And, and you know, the Nets are not going to go anywhere. They'll probably hold hold off the Wizards just because uh, no Beal and no Davis Bertans. But this isn't really going to tell us anything for, for meaningful for the future unless it's, you know, Levert's going to have the ball in his hands all the time. Maybe he can impress someone enough where his trade value goes up if the Nets decide they want to package him elsewhere because he's not a great fit with some of the other guys. Uh, but it's more about, you know, they should be seeing what they have in some of these role guys that didn't get much of a chance this year. And bringing in two veterans who aren't good and have absolutely no upside doesn't help the team now or later. Yeah, these guys aren't going to help them win. And they're talking, oh, yeah, well, if they're going to get into a playoff game, they need these guys. And I agree that Jamal Crawford can be a really, really strong mentor. But in the last five seasons... Crawford's best on-off number was minus seven. That was his best number. He had two years of, of minus 13. Like, these are rough, rough numbers. Last year, yeah, I, I know he scored 51 points in his last game. That was not a real NBA game. He took a ton of shots. He's still inefficient. Defensively, it's it's bad. And, and I just, I, it feels like a pandering move to guys like KD. And, and I agree, like, what are we going to do? Is Michael Beasley going to come in here because there's no Prince or Chandler? Is he going to start? Why wouldn't we see what Jan and Musa can do? Why wouldn't you see what Rodion's Kuruks could do? Justin Anderson, I love them signing him because I think he can still be a, a decent rotation player. At least there's hope for him in the future. Jamal, Jamal Crawford's 40. Michael Beasley's 31. What, what, what are we doing with these guys? Maybe Beasley's had moments of being productive in the last two years, but not necessarily... Um, yeah, by positive impact on winning, I, I just I don't I don't get it. And I, yeah, look, you mentioned Chiozza, who Nets fans have been loving. Man, he's great. We found our backup point guard. Now they're going to give yeah, Crawford minutes over him potentially, and Tyler Johnson. Like how are they, how are they going to run this rotation? What's your best guess at what the starting five will be for this team? Yeah, it's it's going to be hard to tell because you know with like I don't does Crawford even have the conditioning to play a lot of minutes? I mean, he's been out the hasn't played the whole season. Uh, so I, I don't even know how that's going to look like. My best guess is that, you know, I probably think they're going to go with Tyler Johnson over Chioza at point guard just because Sean Marks has been enamored with him for a while and they like Chioza, but maybe want to protect him from being overexposed, even though it's exposed. It's like exposed to what? Because everyone knows he's not going to be like a long-term answer as a starter, but he could be a nice bench guy and you might as well throw him out there. I think they're kind of going to want to go with something more dependable. So I'd say TJ and Levert are starting backcourt. Temple, Kuruks, Jared Allen. I mean, really, the only locks there are Levert, Temple, and Jared Allen. Uh, and I would say Harris. 
Oh, yep, you're right, Joe Harris. So, yeah, I, so take out Temple and move him to the bench and have Harris there. And then guys who are definitely going to get minutes would be Chioza, TLC. I mean, Beasley's going to play probably because they do need a backup four. Um, I thought they were going to go small more and maybe play Kirk's at backup five, but now they signed Dante Hall. So the whole thing is a mess. I mean, this is like a, this is actually a team that Beasley might make a bit more watchable, but who cares? Like he's a guy that actually has some decent scoring seasons when he's kind of anchoring a second unit on a terrible team. So seasons that have no implications, but he can, you know, put up buckets, but it's just like so irrelevant to both this season and when the Nets are going to be good. He's buddies with KD. So that's why he's getting a contract, but he doesn't shoot threes at all. He doesn't play any defense. He likes to ISO and hold the ball. And how is that a good fit on a team where, you know, he would be, you know, the seventh or eighth offensive option at best? I've heard, um, you know, people say, well, this makes this makes the Nets more watchable by having Beasley and Crawford there. I, watching these two guys just you trade ISO possessions uh, between the, each other, I, I don't I don't really see it. As much as I, I really like Jamal Crawford, I don't particularly like Michael Beasley in that sense. It just doesn't make a huge amount of sense. Now, let's talk about the center position because that's something that you know, people who are playing your fantasy in the resumption here are going to want to know because Jarrett Allen was, inex- well, not inexplicably, because the explanation for him being benched was um, that that was why uh, Kenny Atkinson was fired so DeAndre Jordan could start. But now there is literally no other center on this team. So this is this is the opportunity for Jarrett Allen. It, they have to give him minutes because actually, again, nobody else can play that position. So, what are we hoping from him here? I think he's, I think he's in line for some pretty, pretty big numbers and a huge fantasy contribution. Yeah, I think he'll put up big counting stats because you know he's really the only option there, and I, he's kind of in store for I'd say thirty-two minutes a game. I mean, they don't want to tire him out at all and don't want to risk injury because there's you know talks that they might want to shop him after the season, even though. I'm not sure what his value is going to be since any team would have to extend him after uh, the 2020-21 season. And there's a glut of centers out there. Um, It's a very saturated position. But, you know, his counting stats were really good this year even, and especially his efficiency stats. I think his efficiency will take a hit. I would be surprised if he reaches that 65% field goal percentage he had in the regular season just because the Nets have no perimeter offensive weapons now really besides Levert and no one that can beat him easy opportunities. But he's definitely going to have a chance to show what he's made of. Um, I think he's going to be out there a lot. He's going to, you know, pick up rebounds, blocks. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of missed shots, both by the Nets and their opponents, because everyone's rusty. So expect for him to be a really solid fantasy contributor. But unfortunately, kind of a lost cause in terms of uh, him helping the rest of the team win, just because the talent is so bare on the rest of the roster. Levert's also going to be in line for some yeah, pretty huge minutes, I would imagine, and specifically really big usage. He was putting up big numbers beforehand, before Dinwiddie wasn't playing, and now, of course, Dinwiddie's not there. But he has been a guy that has struggled significantly with efficiency, uh, free throw shooting, field goal percentage, three-point percentage, and I think the extra usage might stress that further. But I imagine we see him put up in these eight games and whatever happens in the playoffs, you know, career-type scoring and assist numbers. Because they're going, despite if they start Tyler Johnson, who's not really a point guard, they could also start Garrett Temple at point guard. Again, who's not really a point guard. Levert is going to be the point guard in a LeBron James sense of the word and the guy that's initiating pretty much all of the offense. Yeah, no, I mean, he's going to be kind of the the one running the show for the Nets at a a pretty high usage this year. I mean, 29% usage is pretty... uh, up there yeah. so i think you it's know like definitely getting into low to mid 30s usage wise because he is that that main guy for the nets um you know so even before this when it was just kind of him and dinwiddie at the very end of the season um you know he was getting a ton of usage and now with all those other guys they're going to defer to him and he's going to have to be the nets main offensive engine i have a lot of efficiency concerns both with him being the main guy and even with him playing more of a complementary role when the nets roster uh is at full strength is what he projects as um, so I think he's going to struggle with, you know, efficiency, but overall he's going to put up some really nice counting stats. And also I think assist totals will be strong because he is that Nets primary facilitator, uh, right now. Over his last 11 games, his usage was already up to 31%. And now without Dinwiddie, uh, that's, it's going to, uh, it's going to absolutely skyrocket from there would be my, would be my guess. Um, where, where's Kuruks at? Because we saw him start lots of games last season uh, and looked pretty good in that and then sort of you know, disappeared this year. We didn't really get to see anything from him. Of course, had the legal charges uh, holding over him. Played just 13 minutes a night as Chandler and Prince both stepped up uh, ahead of him. Um, 
do you think you know, is he going to be a major rotation piece here? Like, where's he at in his career? Yeah, it, I mean, it's tough. I think you know, I loved him in his rookie season, and and Josh, I feel like every time I come on here, me and you are just you know, both preaching the choir, saying we love Kurex, we love Kurex. He needs to get more minutes because he does have a unique skill set on this Nets team in terms of being a guy with size, long. Um, you know, three point shot not great right now, but maybe the makings of it long term and can make things happen with his activity and energy. You know, he just lost a lot of the faith of the coaching staff with that off the court incident to start the year. And then when he was starting to play at the beginning of the season, just looked completely, you know, lost in the sauce. Uh, afraid to shoot the three at all, would, would fake from the three point line and dribble in, but was traveling like an obscene amount. There would be possessions in a row where he was getting called for either a double dribble or traveling and he just didn't look like an nba player uh i still am pretty bullish on him long term and think he had some nice strides uh when you look at kind of what he was doing in, in january and february so think you know he'll get a shot here to show what he's made of and this is going to be his best opportunity for playing time i would be very surprised if they're not throwing him out there you know at 25 minutes a game given no torian prince no wilson chandler and obviously no kd uh, and even with no DeAndre Jordan, there's he's really the Nets' best option if they want to go for a small ball five. What do we... Um, last player I really want to touch on here is John and Musa, who I had pretty high hopes of as a first-round pick. Just you know, took a bit of time to develop. In the G League, his numbers were fantastic. 20 points a game, 41% on threes at over four attempts per game. Eight and a half boards, three assists. Uh, he put up some really good G League numbers. And again, there is this opportunity here with... Uh, a lack of power forwards with both Prince and uh, Chandler out with a lack of ball handlers because he shows some ability to do that. There is a real, I thought there'd be a real opportunity, but with how they're framing these signings, it feels like he's going to be left out again, which is, seems absolute nonsensical to me. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm not super high on Musa. I think he's kind of that typical, you know, if you compare it to baseball, which I know you guys don't have in Australia, but yeah, like quadruple A player there that, you know, can do really well when he's in the minors, but when he gets called up in the majors, just doesn't have enough juice there. And I think that's the case with him. You know, it's really hard for him to beat anyone off the dribble, um, you know, given his lack of uh, speed and burst. Defensively, he's lost. Uh, you know, he likes to pull up from deep from three, but the results aren't there in an NBA uh, very small sample size, admittedly. But with the Nets, he's just not been able to do it. Been a really nice piece of their G League team, but I just don't think they have a ton of confidence in him. They gave him a shot this year, uh, much more so than last year. Got in 35 games, uh, you know, when the Nets had a, a dearth of players at that guard role, and he just didn't impress to the point where I would be pretty shocked if he's on the team. Let's say maybe 18 months from now. So you think they might decline his uh, his fourth year option? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think given the way that the roster is turning and, and seems like a mandate from KD and Kyrie to get more veterans on the roster, you have a guy in Musa who, you know, was a first round pick, but 29th overall, two years with the team. And it's just been so unimpressive. And at 21 years old, I just don't think the Nets see much of a future for him, given that they need pieces who are more, I'd say low usage and defensive oriented around some of their top guys. Uh, and he certainly does not fit that. He needs to be able to make mistakes, have the ball in his hands, you know, go to a team like Chicago or something where there's no pressure right now. I just don't see how his development fits on a team that has a mandate to win. Um, I agree that he doesn't particularly fit all that well with Kevin Durant there and with uh, with, with Levert and Irving. Um, but again, this is the, the f perfect opportunity to me to see exactly if he can do that or what he can do and maybe get some trade value. But I agree that the fit with Durant for Musa moving forward is not uh, is not fantastic. So this is a team that's going to be relying heavily on Allen and Levert and Joe Harris and, and probably Tyler Johnson as their top four options would, would be how I would guess things, especially from a fantasy point of view. But we've talked about that. Yeah, Timothy Lawaii Cabra even came out and said, oh, yeah, he's he'd play the five at some point, which would be an absolutely wild lineup for a bloke that's played here. A lot of shooting guard in the NBA to see him out there uh, playing those minutes. Be maybe Beasley is the backup center when he, uh, when he gets back into action. But there is... Some weird stuff going on. There are guys I'd like to see play. There are guys I'd like to see less uh, less of out on the court. But absolutely a team that's probably... Um, yeah, well, actually, let's get your prediction on this, Josh, because this team is decimated and they look rough. But the team that's looking to push into the playoff or play-in game with them is equally decimated, the Wizards. Do you think that the Nets can hold off a... It's currently a six-game gap. They If they get it to within four, they have to get that play-in game. Can they, can they win uh, or win at least two two fewer games in the Wizards. How, even though that's the most butchered centers I've ever thrown out there. 
can they avoid a play-in game? Yeah, I, I think they can. I mean, I think these are two teams that you'll you'll see and probably. I mean, would anyone be surprised if they go zero and eight, one and seven? That's true. I mean, if everything uh, off cylinders go two and six, but like, I don't know. The Nets do have Karis Levert, who is a above average good NBA player, and there's no one on the Wizards roster right now that resembles that. That's going to be in Orlando. Yep. So as much as I love, you know, Ish Smith, and he's going to put up insane fantasy numbers. As I'm sure you've talked about. And, you know, Rui Hachimura and Troy Brown, I think the Nets, uh, shockingly still, will be able to fend off the Wizards. Let's see how this all works out. These teams are, are very interesting to watch, Josh. Uh, Josh, thank you for coming on with me, and you'll have everything covered from a Nets perspective over on Locked On Nets. Anytime. Thanks for having me. All right, guys, so that'll do it for today's today's show. We're looking at, at the Wizards and the Nets. And again, I've updated some projections over on Basketball Monster for the remainder of this season, as much as you're wanting to play fantasy there. Guys like Allen, Levert look really, really strong as top 50 potential options on the Brooklyn Nets. You've got Joe Harris, who's probably going to get a, a spike there as well. Tyler Johnson could be a guy that has some impact. Uh, then you've got the, the fringe guys like Temple and Kuroks. Uh, Jamal Crawford, not an option. Maybe Justin Anderson has some occasional flashes. Maybe Lawawu Cabrero has some options if they give Chiozza a starting role. He'd be an interesting player to take a look at. So there is some uh, some weird stuff with this team. And then on, uh, on Washington... It is going to come down to what they do with Napier and Ishmith. I think Napier can play next to Smith. So I think he probably gets the bulk of those minutes. They maybe split the point guard role, and then you get Shabazz playing some shooting guard as well. You'll get Tom Bryant, Rui Hachimura, uh, Troy Brown, Mo Wagner, Ishmith, all those guys having some fantasy value as well. Uh, and, and just watch to see what they do with Jerome Robinson, who had a couple of good games. He's also not very good and not a very good fantasy option. So probably not someone yeah, we should be looking at. Uh, all that uh, all that heavily as we move forward. Guys, subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. <laughs>